Good gentles, I am the Honorable Lord Brendan O'Quarry, and it is my great pleasure and honor to present to you tonight the tale of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Now you may have encountered this in school, and you may be thinking, Dear God, no! 1,200 lines of alliterative Middle English! No! I'm not going to do it to you, because I don't want to do it to me! Instead, this is my thought of how the tale might have been told before that damned poet sunk his hooks into it. <sighs> In the days when Arthur held court at Camelot, it was the custom of the king on feast days not to take his meat or drink until some marvel had appeared before his hall. <laughs> this being Camelot, in usual and customary times, the king had not long to wait upon his meal. But on this particular New Year's Eve, the venison was growing cold. And Arthur was about to lean over to Merlin and say, You old conjurer, will you do something before we all starve to death? When the doors of the hall burst open, and in rode a giant of a knight, twice the height of an ordinary man, on a steed to match. Clad all in green he was, from his shoulders to the tips of his soft leather shoes, his robes richly embroidered with golden thread, bees and butterflies and birds. His hair fell about his shoulders, his beard upon his chest like a bishop's mantle. His eyes glittered like emeralds, shot through with gold. In his hand, he held an axe as long as a man is tall, its half decorated with green leather studded with gold and gems, its broad blade as long as a forearm, glittering in the flickering fire. But this was not the strangest aspect of this knight's appearance, for his very skin was the color of moss in the deepest forest. <laughs> Sir Lancelot leapt to his feet. Who are you? To enter the presence of the king, unbidden, unannounced, and bearing warlike weapons. Peace, friend, said Arthur. Good Sir Knight, I bid you welcome. I fear we were not surprised in advance of your appearance, else we should have prepared more victuals. I fear, should we pile all our trenches together, we would not satisfy your appetite. My appetite? I will tell you of my appetite, King Arthur. I've heard the tales of your knights of the round table, of their prowess and their honor. And I do doubt them. I own there is not a man in this hall who will stand toe to toe with me and trade blows with my axe. So I give him the first stroke. Arthur looked round his table. No knight would meet his gaze. Even Lancelot and Boars toyed with their food rather than meet the king's eye. Suddenly, young Gavin was at the king's elbow. Uncle, give me this challenge. What? You're just a boy. I am a knight, and that by your own hand. But look at the size of him. He'll crush you with a single stroke. Your Majesty may recall that it pleased the Lord our God to deliver the giant Goliath into the hands of a shepherd boy. And may he do the same tonight. Look round your table. None of your knights will meet your gaze, and well they should not, for they have much to lose. I have not to lose but my own young life, but much to gain in the way of fame and honor. And if I should fall, then let it be said that I fell defending the king's honor. But let no man ever say that a challenge in the king's own hall went unanswered for lack of knightly courage. 
Arthur looked over at Merlin, who merely raised an eyebrow. Very well then, and may God go with you. Gallant strode out into the center of the hall. The Green Knight looked down and laughed. <laughs> Has the king no squires or page boys that he sends a child out to treat with me? I am not page boy, but the knight of this round table, and I will prove myself upon your body and teach you the meaning of courtesy. Well, the pup has a bark and a brave one at that. What is your name, little knight? I am Gowan of the Round Table. <laughs> Gowan of the Round Table. I am called the Green Knight. Let us review the rules of our little game. This is my axe. I will give it to you. You shall attempt to strike me with it. I shall make no defense. If I should somehow survive your mighty blow, I will hit you back at a time and a place of my choosing. Do you agree? I swear it on my honor as a knight. Well, certainly that is small enough surety, but if it must suffice, it shall suffice. Catch! <clears throat> Gowan was young, having not yet seen a score of summers, but he was no mere stripling youth. He was the son of King Lot of Orkney, Raised and trained in the service of Arthur! He seized the axe in midair, planted his feet, found its balance, swung from the hip, and at a single stroke locked the giant's head clean from its shoulders. The head rolled beneath the table where the knights kicked at it as though it were a ball laughing. <laughs> but the dogs backed away, whining, their tails between their legs. For the body, standing in the center of the hall, fountaining blood, did not fall. It strode forward, seized the head, and turned it to face Gowan. Meet me in a year and a day at the Chapel of the Green Knight. Remember your oath. And at that, the horrid apparition mounted his horse and rode out into the freezing darkness. Arthur slowly stood. Well, that was a wonder to see if ever I have seen one. Serve forth the feast! And will someone get that door? X on the wall above Gowan's seat at the round table. And all who saw it remarked merrily upon Gowan's courage and prowess. Gowan, for his part, could only think of the journey which he must soon undertake. The year passed all too quickly. Winter melted into spring. Spring blossomed into summer. Summer ripened into autumn, and as the first fruits of the harvest were being brought in, Gowan made preparation for his journey. And on All Hallows morning, he woke, was bathed, dressed in new white linen, armed and armored, and went into the chapel to hear Mass, receive the Eucharist, make his confession, and thus be shriven of his sins. <coughs> he went out to the courtyard and mounted his palfrey and was handed up his shield. And on his shield shall we tarry a moment, for ne'er was knight more ably defended. Of sturdy stuff it was, of course, lindenwood, covered with leather, painted a royal red as befits the son of a king. On it, limbed in gold, the pentangle, the five-pointed star made of a single ribbon interlacing upon itself with neither beginning nor end, symbolizing the eternal fate which awaited Gowan, and indeed us all. Each of the five points of the star represented one of the five-fold knightly qualities which Gowan possessed in abundance. First, the strength of his five fingers, which never failed. Second, the keenness of his five senses through which he perceived the world around him. Third, the five knightly virtues, courage, 
loyalty, comradeship, compassion, and generosity. The fifth, the fourth point represented the five wounds of Christ suffered upon the cross for Gowan's salvation and ours. The fifth point represented the five wounds of Mary, Mother of God, Queen of Heaven, she whose image was painted on the inside of Gowan's shield, whereupon he could gaze and gain courage whene'er he felt afraid. I see confusion in your eyes. Think it you strange that a hero should feel fear? Nay, tis not so. Only the fool knows no fear. The hero takes his fear in hand, examines it from every angle, peruses each page, and when he has known his fear in full, sets it behind him to do the thing which must be done. And thus, arrayed as no night before or since, Gowan set the gates of Camelot behind him, and no dry eye saw his going. For many days Gowan rode, and at every farm and hamlet he stopped and asked if any knew the dwelling place of the Green Knight, or the road upon where it might, might be found, but none could give him answer. Eventually he rode beyond the dwelling places of man, into wild and rocky woodlands. Seldom had he food he liked, no company had he but his horse, no comfort but his paternoster, which was always in his hand, giving over his life and his mission and his very soul to the care of heaven. Most nights he slept in steel on hard cold stone, his helm for a pillow. Never did he ford mountain stream or top mountain pass, but he was confronted with some wild man or fell beast requiring the dispatch of his sword. It would be tedious to tell the tenth part of his adventures. And so it came to pass that on Christmas Eve, in a pouring, driving, blinding, freezing rain, as he thrust through a thicket of thorns, he saw in the distance a light in the tower. Shoving aside the last of the shrubbery, he crossed a wide lawn and pounded on the gate with the pommel of his sword, crying admittance for the mercy of Christ and in the name of the King. The door opened, and strong hands bore him inward, seated him by a fire, wrapped him in a warm blanket, brought him meat and mulled wine. Soon the Lord and Lady of the castle came to take the measure of their unexpected guests. Gowan told them his story, and at the mention of Camelot, a frisson ran round the hall. Come, we have a knight of Camelot in our midst. Now shall we see true courtesy. Now shall we see nobleness and gentleness on display. We have a knight from Camelot there. The Lord and Lady Bertolac, for that was the name of the castle, were a fine, handsome couple, well built to rule noble people. The Lord Bertillac, hale and hearty despite being of middling years. His hair and beard fell about his shoulders, his eyes twinkled merrily, and his laugh was loud and used often, and merry was it indeed. The Lady Bertillac. Poets despaired when she entered the room, for all of their superlatives fled before her beauty. Indeed, the very rose would grow pale at the sight of her lips. The milk would blush at the sight of her cheeks. There was no woman in all the world more fair in face and form, save perhaps Queen Guinevere herself. Gowan thanked the Lord and Lady for their hospitality but explained that he must away on the morn to continue his quest to find the castle of the Green Knight. At this, Lord Bertillac laughed, <laughs> My friend, I know well the dwelling place of this Green Knight. It is less than a day's journey from here. You shall rest, restore your strength, celebrate the Christmas season with us. <laughs> on the appointed morning, one of my squires shall show you the track. In the meantime, still without open a cask, we have a guest from Camelot! And so 
so they drank to friendships old and new, drank to memories made and those yet to be made, and so eventually to bed. They passed the Christmas season with great joy and merriment, with music and dancing and feasting and games and solemn, joyous masses, and passed with this Christmas season in good measure. After some days, the guests departed, and Bertillac came to Gowan and said, My friend, on the morrow I must needs go hunting to replenish my somewhat depleted larder. <laughs> But you, return, remain here. Regain your strength, rest. But so that your day will not be entirely without amusement, let us make a wager between us. Whatever I gain in the woods and the fields, I shall give to you as your prize of the day. You, in return, remit to me whatever you might have won. Are you agreed? Indeed. Stuart, open a cask. And they drank to seal the deal, and drank to friendships old and new, and drank to memories yet to be made, and so, eventually, to bed. In the morning, Bertillac depart departed before dawn in a flurry of hooves, horns, and hounds. Gowan, for his part, remained in bed, and was awakened by the scrape of his chamber door and soft footsteps in the rushes. He felt a weight settle on the end of his bed. He feigned sleep, but soon realized that his visitor was determined to outweigh him. And so he gave a great stretch and a yawn, and he sat up and snatched the covers to his chin, because sitting at the end of his bed was not some page boy sent up to dress him, but the Lady Bertillac. Dressed in a plain linen shift, her hair unbound, falling about her shoulders. Good morning, sir. How is it that a knight on quest sleeps so soundly? Well, hey, lady, it is true that a knight on campaign may sleep soundly when safe within the walls of a trusted friend. Ah, this word to I am not your friend. I am your sworn enemy, and I hold you captive and take you for ransom. She pinned his shoulders to the bed by the sheet. Her face an inch from his, her breath was sweet, her hair fell about them both. My lady, I own I am well and fairly captured, and there was captor, captive, more captivated by a captor. But as you may see in my present condition, I am in no wise able to pay ransom. She sat up and her gaze swept from his eyes to his feet and back. Oh, I doubt that very much. And in likewise manner they bantered through the morning, the lady flirtatious, yes, forward, not so much as to give offense nor fool the wagging tongues of gossips. Gowan, for his part, with all nobility and humor, parrying her advances as one might a sparring partner upon the practice field. Eventually, the lady relented and said, Ah, oh, Gowan, I have kept you from your breakfast, and though I would detain you through lunch, I shall release you from your bound bonds on condition that you remit to me some token of your affection and the kiss of your Aye, my lady. And he sat up and kissed her chastely upon the cheek as a brother might a sister. She sighed as she stood. Certainly that is small enough surety, but if it must suffice, it shall suffice. And she tried to make me out of the room. That evening, Bertillac returned, covered in mud and brambles, his hands and arms soaked in blood to the forearms. His face split with a wide grin. Gowan, you should have seen the slaughter we made! Ha ha! We cornered an entire herd in a box canyon. Oh, the singing of the arrows, the music of the hounds. Such a slaughter, you should have seen the size of the gut piles. Ha ha ha! The dogs feasted well, I tell you. Now here's your prize. And 
his men brought forth a huge stag that they had won that day. He set it down. Oh, Gowan, what have you for me? Gowan bethought himself of the day, and he had not played at cards or dice. And then he recalled his adventure of the morning. He raised an eyebrow. He smiled. He stepped forward, seized Birchalak by both corners of his beard, and kissed him full on the mouth. <laughs> well, I see your day has not been entirely without sport. <laughs> Shall we renew our wager for the morrow? Stella, open a cast! And so they drank to seal the deal, and drank to friendships old and new, and drank to friends not soon forgotten, and so, eventually, to bed. The second morning, Bertilak again departed in a flurry of hooves, horns, and hounds. Gowan again remained to bed, and was awakened by the Lady Bertilak, who entered his chamber boldly, sat down upon his bed, and kissed him before he had even opened his eyes. They resumed their conversation of the previous morning. The lady flirtatious? Yes. Forward? Not so much as to give offense nor fuel the wagging tongues of gossips, but it was clear with any to he ears to hear that had Gowan desired more entertainment than mere conversation, the lady would not have required much in the way of persuasion. But Gowan, gallant as always, deflected her advances as one might carry those of an expert swordsman upon the field. Again, she relented, released him from his bonds, having won no prize from him other than a second chaste kiss. That evening, Bertilak again returned, again spattered with mud, covered in brambles, his face set in a grim grin of satisfaction. His men bore in behind him, a massive boar with tusks like daggers, broken spears in its side, and Bertilak's sword thrust through its skull. Well, Gowan, the little piggy gave us quite a fight. Wounded two of my men, though, praise God, I'm told they will walk again killed several of my good hounds. But we'll have bacon through the winter! Ha <laughs> ha! Here is your prize, Gowan! Now, what have you for me? Gowan raised an eyebrow. Bertilak's face fell. Gowan smiled, stepped forward, seized him by the corners of the beard, and kissed him once and twice full on the mouth. Well, Gowan, I see your game is improving. <laughs> Dare we renew our wager for a third day? Still at open a cast! And tell the butcher to retrieve my sword and be careful about it. And so they drank to seal the deal, and drank to great adventures and friendships old and new, and so eventually to bed. The third morning, Bertilak again departed in a flurry of hooves, horns, and hounds. Gowan, for his part, remained to bed until he was awakened by the Lady Bertilak, who entered his chamber in what might be seen as desperation, flung herself on him full length, <coughs> kissed him once, twice, three times, begged him to make love to her there and then. My lady! He pushed her roughly away. She fell to the floor. How dare you speak such words of shame? I would not dishonor your, you, or myself, or, or my friend, your husband, in his own house. face the green knight. <laughs> if you will not love me, then will you take this from me and save your life? And she pressed into his hands a finely woven green belt shot through with golden threads. It shimmered in the morning light. This, this is a magical belt. Wear it beneath your armor and tell no man that you wear it and it will keep you safe from all weapons. Please, Gowan! <laughs> and she fled the room in tears. Gowan sat with the belt in his hands. 
for a very long time. That evening, Bertilak again returned. Again covered in mud, his hair decorated with brambles, holding in his hand the skin of a fox. Well, Yavin, old Renard led us a merry chase over field and fen. My man had to take down two farmers' walls to have at him. Eventually, the horns, the hounds had him cornered, though. They would have torn him to pieces had I not stepped in and <laughs> saved his skin. <laughs> Here is your prize. The, the furrier can patch it up. <laughs> now, dare I ask, what are you for me? Gowan thought back on the day. He had not played at dice or cards or chess. But he bethought himself of the morning. He raised an eyebrow. No. He smiled. No, 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 no. Too late. <laughs> Gowan seized him by the beard and kissed him once, twice, three times. <laughs> oh, Gowan. It seems your game steadily improves with practice. <laughs> A pity that we cannot renew our wager for the morrow. Oh, do not be downcast. I know this old demon well like it's not, he's not even there. Make your appearance, write your name in the snow, and be gone away home. Stow it up in a cask! But Gowan had no heart for revelry, and early went to bed. In the morning, he awoke, was bathed, dressed in New white linen, armed with his armor repaired and polished, went into the chapel to hear Mass, receive the Eucharist, make his confession, and thus be shriven of his sins, for what he was certain was the last time. A squire was waiting for him in the courtyard. They rode to the castle gate, and there stood the Lady Bertillac alone. My lady, where is your knight? He was called away on urgent business of the castle. And the bell? No man knows, my lady. No man knows. And they set the castle behind. They rode for some hours in pleasant fields until they came to a place where the road diverged to the right the left. Sir Gowan, I beg of you, do not take the left hand turning, for that way lies only death and destruction. Turn to the right, go home, live your life, no one will know. Squire, I thank you for your service, but I would know. And every day, by a thousand hours deaths, return to your master. And may God preserve your life. And so Gallant turned to the left, alone. The trail soon narrowed, twisting and turning beneath high and craggy rocks. There was no rustle of leaves, no trill of birdsong, but only the cold moaning of the frigid wind through barren and twisted branches. The icy trickle of water on black rock and the hollow clatter of his horse's hooves on the ice-shattered rock below. Gowan rode, twisting and turning, as the road grew narrower and darker and colder until it turned once more and opened into a clearing. And Gowan knew this must be the place. A stench of death and decay hung about the place. There was an ancient stone chapel, its roof long since collapsed. The stone cross in the courtyard, fallen and broken.
Javan dismounted and for a moment hoped that he might be the man. that they wore until the end of their days to always remember the lesson of Gawain and the Green Knight. <laughs> 